I uh, still focus on women's disease. <laughs> it started a long time ago being the first woman, and caring for diseases of women is really my focus. So here you see the picture of a young woman with lupus. You see the butterfly rash. Make it louder? OK, make it louder. <laughs> so I'm going to reposition this, I think. I have a low voice, though my kids tell me I don't. <laughs> or they have. Uh, so uh, lupus is an autoimmune disease. It's more frequent in women. And I understand now why I was asked to come to this meeting. Because the title is Facilitating Health Decisions in the Face of Uncertainty. And most of what we do in lupus is in a data sparse area. There's tremendous uncertainty. And most clinical trials have not been terribly successful in lupus, so we live in uncertainty. And when you give a woman the diagnosis of lupus, one of the first things she says is, can I have children? And until recently, many patients with lupus were told that they should never become pregnant. And this wasn't based on data. It was based on very thoughtful intuition. Lupus is a disease of women. Pregnancy is a hyperfeminizing state. You become pregnant if you have lupus. Your lupus will flare. Your organs will become inflamed. And you might die. So that was the recommendation when I was training. So I'll start out by telling you a little bit about autoimmunity. You've heard about it from other speakers. In lupus, the immune system that was really, that evolved to protect us from invading microbes and dangers turns against the self. So in a protective immune response, what happens is that the microbes invade these little blue guys. You develop antibodies, these little Ys. The antibodies are really <coughs> markers. They mark organisms, dying cells, pathological invaders. They mark them for, for destruction. The inflammatory mediators are mostly proteins and cells that destroy the bugs. And the antibodies stay there and protect you indefinitely. In autoimmunity, what happens is you develop antibodies, but the antibodies recognize self-protein. And those antibodies bind to the self-proteins, attack the organs expressing the self-proteins, leading to irreversible tissue damage. Now, there is organ-specific autoimmunity, like type 1 diabetes, where the antibodies recognize antigens in the beta cells, multiple sclerosis, the central nervous system. But lupus is unique because it's a multi-system autoimmune disease, and the immune response is broadly reactive against self. And what patients with lupus suffer from is destruction of blood cell elements, arthritis, inflammation in the heart and the lung, brain fog. And the most dreaded complication is irreversible kidney failure. And now we can transplant them, but it's not a particularly good situation. This painting in the MoMA by Klimt, I think, reflects what a woman faces who has lupus and is pregnant or wants to become pregnant. The, the pregnant lady's head is bowed. She's closing her eyes as if in prayer for the safety of her unborn child. The head of death is lurking ominously, a sign of the danger she may face. And at her feet, there are three women, solemn, their heads bowed, underscoring the potential, and I, under, I emphasize the word the potential, the potential for a tragic outcome. So as I told you, lupus is a disease of women. In fact, 90% of lupus patients are women. It typically presents during childbearing age, so most people are between 20 and 40. And it's certainly clear that pregnant women have higher rates of adverse pregnancy outcomes. What are the challenges for society and for clinicians? The challenge is, is identifying those women destined for the complications so that you can counsel them and care for patients, and also so that you can more equitably allocate resources. If patients will do well, you don't have to spend an awful lot of money caring for them. And you also need to develop treatments 
to prevent or treat these poor pregnancy outcomes and to develop treatments, you have to understand mechanisms. So we had two problems. We didn't know prevalence, we didn't know risk factors, and we didn't know mechanisms. And I hope today what I'll do is address all of those questions, at least in a preliminary way. So the specific pregnancy complications that women with lupus suffer, they have miscarriage, preterm delivery, growth restriction of the fetuses, and an entity called preeclampsia or toxemia that I'll tell you a bit more about. And ultimately, in a small set of patients, there's fetal death or death of the newborn. So what's preeclampsia? If you watch Downton Abbey, my husband's favorite character was Sybil. She died of preeclampsia, and I think the demonstration of preeclampsia in that show was extraordinary. It's a pregnancy-specific disorder. It's defined by the appearance of hypertension and proteinuria, that is protein in the urine, and it generally presents after 20 weeks gestation. But what's really important about preeclampsia is though it presents clinically at 20, after 20 weeks, the pathology is really evolving early on and is silent. So the first stage of preeclampsia is silent. So these are arteries called spiral arteries. This is the developing placenta, the uterine side. This is the maternal side. These arteries are there to nourish the developing placenta early in pregnancy. And you know arteries, they have a thick muscular wall. They have pretty high resistance, not terribly high flow. And we have arteries everywhere, and spiral arteries are like every artery. But in a normal pregnancy, the trophoblasts, the cells of uterine origin, invade the, develop, invade the maternal spiral artery, and they start to line the spiral artery. That's called a trophoblast-modified artery. And what's amazing is when these cells that come from the placenta line the artery, the artery changes. The smooth muscle disappears, and the diameter increases, and you end up with a high flow, low resistance blood vessel that looks more like a vein. And what happens in the beginning of preeclampsia when the patient is well and the doc doesn't know there's a problem is this remodeling fails. And when you have failed remodeling of the uterine spiral arteries, you hypoperfuse the developing placenta. And that hypoperfusion leads to the placenta making factors that are toxic to the mother. So those toxic factors is what, the response to those toxic factors, it was called toxemia, is what we see clinically. It's a maternal response to poor placental blood flow. And the maternal response is characterized by hypertension, protein leaking from the kidneys into the urine, there's proteinuria, and the other end organ manifestations that you see in the slide. So there's a widespread maternal vascular dysfunction related to what we call anti-angiogenic factors, and I'll define them in my next slide. These anti-angiogenic factors are directly toxic to the endothelial cells, the cells that line the blood vessel of the mother, and those are the cells, as they're dying or sick, that cause the clinical phenotype that we see in preeclampsia. So what are these toxic factors and how do they work? And just by way of history, the treatment of preeclampsia, the only treatment, is delivering the baby and delivering the placenta so that you stop producing or secreting these toxic factors into the mother's circulation. That's why it was called toxemia. So what happens in uh, a normal pregnancy and in actually normal blood vessels is this is a blood vessel. These are the endothelial cells. This is the lumen. The endothelial cells express receptors. They're called VEGFR1 and VEGFR2. And these receptors need to receive signals from either VEGF or in pregnancy, a substance called placental growth factor. And these signals are required to maintain the health of the cells lining the blood vessel in specific tissues, in the kidney, in the brain, and in the liver. Some other endothelial cells don't need these factors constitutively. And what happens in preeclampsia is the oxygen-deprived, nutrition-deprived placenta makes a protein called S-flip, which is a splice variant of VEGFR1, 
it has the capacity to bind these ligands. It doesn't signal because it's in the circulation. So the cells, the endothelial cells lining the blood vessels, again, particularly in the glomeruli, which are parts of the kidneys, these cells don't get the constitutive signal they need. They become ill, they become swollen, they don't function well, they die, they become leaky, they fall apart, and that's why your kidney function deteriorates in preeclampsia. And we know that that's true because if you overexpress S flit in pregnant rodents or mammals, you get the classical manifestations of preeclampsia. You get proteinuria and hypertension. And I think even the better biological experiment is a rare complication of anti-VEGF therapy in cancer patients is, in fact, proteinuria and hypertension. They're not pregnant, but the lack of VEGF available to certain endothelial beds leads clinically to preeclampsia. So, you know, we've talked about thousands of patients who get cancer and thousands of patients who get heart disease today. What is the clinical epidemiologic data around pregnancy and lupus patients? So by way of background, there are probably only about half a million lupus patients in the United States. Um, so what happened in the last 20 years in terms of pregnancy outcomes in lupus patients? And this is a paper that's impressed by one of our young trainees who looked at the US national inpatient sample. Almost 80 million pregnancies without lupus, a huge number of pregnancies with lupus over those years. So the in-hospital mortality of the moms has gone down and is quite low. The fetal mortality has gone down, but it's still remarkably higher, and I think clinically important, than non-lupus patients. But preeclampsia hasn't really moved. 10% of lupus patients have preeclampsia. And another important issue to consider is preeclampsia is increasing in the general population. And um, I think what we learn about preeclampsia and lupus we may be able to apply to these patients. So here we have a, a relatively uncommon disease like you've heard about from other speakers, not as rare as some of their diseases, where you can use it as a window to understand pathophysiology, develop therapeutics, and perhaps change public health for more than just the half a million lupus patients in the United States. So by way of predictors, so if these are the complications that lupus patients get, and so, someone's in the office and either wants to get pregnant or is newly pregnant and says, will I do well? Will I have a problem? Really, all we knew until recently was that the presence of a class of antibodies called antiphospholipid antibodies was the strongest predictor of adverse pregnancy outcomes. So I'll digress a moment. Antiphospholipid antibodies occur in about 25% of patients with lupus. They actually occur in a small subset of people who don't have lupus. Clinically, if you have antiphospholipid antibodies, you're at increased risk for blood clots, arterial and venous, heart attacks, pulmonary emboli, phlebitis. And you're also at increased risk for recurrent miscarriage, preeclampsia, growth restriction, and so on. So these antibodies play a role both in the vasculature and in pregnancy. And if you have lupus and have these antibodies, you're at higher risk. So what's the pathophysiology? How can an antibody <coughs> cause these problems? Because patients with antiphospholipid antibodies get blood clots, the dogma was that pregnancy loss related to antiphospholipid antibodies was due to thrombosis in the placenta, end of discussion. But I was an inflammation biologist, and I couldn't understand how an antibody can cause a problem that isn't at least in some part related to inflammation. So I kind of tried to challenge dogma a little, a lot actually. So the antibodies, the antiphospholipid antibodies definitely deposit on the placental cell surface. You can see them there by staining. But what happens? Do you have inflammation or thrombosis or both? So to address that question, we developed a mouse model. Mouse pregnancy is about uh, 21, 22 days. If you inject a mouse with IgG, 
from a normal person. They have lots of little pups. This thing that looks like a necklace is really what a mouse uterus looks like at around day 15, which is at the end of the second trimester of a mouse. If you inject a mouse with IgG from a patient with lupus who has antiphospholipid antibodies, there are quite a number of fetuses that look like they're going to be resorbed. They're dead. They're very small. And the surviving fetuses, or the ones who would survive, that is, are much smaller. So we recapitulate the human phenotype, fetal death and growth restriction. And we could use mice that are knocked out in genes or monoclonal antibodies that block specific pathways or small molecules to understand what are the key pathways in this model that drive miscarriage and drive growth restriction. And we found quite a number of them that we could use and define, I think, a very important pathway of inflammation that identifies therapeutics. So this is the model we developed by looking at lots and lots and lots of mice. So we said the antiphospholipid antibody deposits on the placental surface a group of circulating proteins called complement proteins that become activated by immunoglobulin deposition, and one protein cleaves the other protein, cleaves the other protein, and these activation products lead to the generation of a small protein called C5A. C5A is a potent recruiter of inflammatory cells. So wherever you generate C5A, you bring in neutrophils and monocytes. And these cells have receptors for C5A. And once they're recruited, they become activated and release a whole slew of inflammatory mediators. And we found that if you either block C5A or block the recruitment of neutrophils, you can prevent abnormal placental development and growth restriction and fetal loss. So this is that, oops. So this is this group of experiments. It also worked depleting neutrophils. But there really weren't complement inhibitory therapies that were generally available. And we couldn't deplete pregnant people of neutrophils because of the risk of infection. So we thought about what are the potential mediators downstream of neutrophil and monocyte activation that could be targeted that made sense mechanistically. And TNF-alpha is a very important cytokine for rheumatologists. We block TNF-alpha in rheumatoid arthritis psoriatic arthritis, spondyloarthropathies, inflammatory bowel disease doctors use TNF blockers. They're relatively safe, and they're remarkably potent. So we asked the question, would TNF-alpha play a role in this pregnancy model? And uh, to our delight, we treated mice with TNF-alpha blocker, or we used mice deficient in TNF-alpha and totally rescued the phenotype. But all of these mice got growth restriction or miscarriage. We didn't have preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is a difficult model in a passive transfer of an antibody. But at the time we were doing this work, a BPH5 mouse was created. This was a mouse that was a combination of seven different strains of mice that were bred specifically for hypertension. It was a hypertension scientist who wanted to understand what controls blood pressure. And he created a mouse called the BPH2 mouse. And the BPH5 mouse, and the BPH2 mouse had tremendous hypertension. The BPH5 mouse had a little bit of hypertension. And the problem with the BPH5 mouse with a little bit of hypertension is the litter sizes were tiny. So some really smart postdoc said, gee, mild hypertension, small litter sizes, maybe this mouse gets preeclampsia. And lo and behold, it did. It got hypertension, proteinuria, placental dysfunction. The angiogenic factors were screwed up. There was fetal loss and growth restriction. So it was just a smart postdoc that was just really was thinking laterally. And here there was a, a mouse model with no antibodies, no immune dysfunction, brother-sister matings, no tolerance issues that when it was pregnant got preeclampsia. When it wasn't pregnant, it was fine. It had a little bit of hypertension. So we treated this mouse with a TNF blocker. And remarkably, gratefully, 
Placental dysfunction was resolved. The anatomy of the placenta was corrected. The spiral artery remodeling, which was deficient in the BPH5 mouse, was corrected. The antigenic factors were corrected. Fetal loss and growth restriction were attenuated. So here we had uh, therapeutic. There were six different TNF inhibitors on the market. And we had a target. And how could we decide to do a trial in pregnant people. And you know, we've heard a lot of FDA stories. I'll tell you my story as we go on with the FDA. But we needed a way to predict, predict risk. We knew some lupus patients had pregnancy complications, but we certainly didn't know which ones, other than having an antiphospholipid antibody. So that really gets, again, into the, the title of um, the topic, the title of this symposium really is, how do you facilitate health decisions in the face of uncertainty? We didn't know who would have problems. So we were fortunate to get support of the NIH for a project called the PROMISE study, predictors of pregnancy outcome, biomarkers in antiphospholipid syndrome, and systemic lupus erythematosus. This was a prospective multicenter observational study to identify biomarkers to predict poor pregnancy outcome in these patients. And our goal was subsequently to do a trial. I mean, that was really the thing we were most interested in and most hopeful for. So in Promise, we collected patient information and samples for 11 years. We collected nearly 800 patients. They were seen every month of pregnancy. Of those nearly 800, 200 were healthy controls, and the others either had lupus, lupus plus antiphospholipid antibodies, or only antiphospholipid antibodies. Every patient was enrolled uh, less than 12 weeks gestation. We had eight centers in the United States and Canada. And we don't have millions of samples in our freezer, but we do have a quarter of a million. It's small, it's a rare, relatively rare disease. So what did we learn from Promise and how is it getting us where we want to go? So the first question in lupus pregnancy in terms of ancient literature and concern of rheumatologists is in this hyperfeminine state, in this disease of women, will lupus flare during pregnancy? All of our patients, by design, had inactive disease at the time they were enrolled. They weren't allowed to be in our study if their lupus was flagrant, if they had fulminant nephritis or any other serious manifestations. And what we found is that in the patients who were relatively inactive when they were enrolled, mild to moderate flares occurred in about 20%, but none of them needed treatment. A little rash, a little achiness, and they could kind of get their way through. And severe flares were, I think, exceptionally uncommon. 6% of patients, no one developed new kidney disease who didn't have kidney disease before. So pregnancy is safe if you begin it when your disease is inactive. But what about the fetal outcomes, which is what we were particularly interested in? Of our nearly 400 lupus patients, 20% of them had an adverse pregnancy outcome, fetal death, neonatal death, preterm delivery or small for gestational age babies. So what was special? What was unique about those 19% of patients? What at baseline would have helped us predict? And what we found, I think, was somewhat surprising. If you were a non-Hispanic white, you, had, you were protected. You had a 50%, nearly 50% less likelihood of any of these complications. And that's very interesting because it wasn't related to missed appointments. We looked at that. It wasn't related to compliance on medication because these patients weren't really on medications. It was related to socioeconomic factors largely, education and the income and education level in the zip code in which you lived. I don't know how we can intervene to change that, but I think it's an important finding to keep in mind as we move forward. Um, being on an antihypertensive medication was a very strong risk factor, so I think that speaks to the fact that the vasculature in hypertensive patients is different and is more vulnerable. Having a lower platelet count, 
having a lupus anticoagulant. And a lupus anticoagulant, it sounds like it's an anticoagulant. It's actually a procoagulant. The name is wrong. It's a kind of antiphospholipid antibody. And this was the only antiphospholipid antibody that was highly correlated, and probably it is the most important risk factor for adverse pregnancy outcomes in patients with lupus. And physician global assessment is the docs gestalt when they see the patient, are they sick or not in terms of their lupus? And it's a score of one to four. Most of our patients had very low scores, but if you were more than one, you were at increased risk. So if you look at the patients, this is all comers with lupus. The, the blue bars represent the patients with lupus who had none of the risk factors you saw on the previous table. The red broken line reflects the population norm, all comers in the thousands of patients in the United States, what the outcomes would be. And you see that if you have none of the four risk factors, your likelihood of a poor outcome is as good, if not better, than the general population. So among women with no baseline risk factors, the likelihood of an adverse outcome is under 8%. If you look at adverse outcomes in patients who either were lupus anticoagulant positive or lupus anticoagulant negative, but were non-white or Hispanic or were treated with antihypertensives, 58% of them had a poor outcome and 22% of them had a fetal or neonatal death. This observational study has allowed us to, I think, reassure patients that if their disease is stable and inactive, they can be reassured. And I think that really influences the care they get. Instead of getting monthly sonograms and instead of being really anxious, I think we can allocate resources to the patients who have risk factors. And the goal really is to put them into clinical trials. How about the biomarkers? So I told you about the angiogenic factors. How do they perform in lupus patients? Can we use biomarkers to predict serious adverse outcomes? We stratified the pregnancy outcomes. The blue are healthy controls. The green are patients who had good pregnancies. The pink are patients with lupus or APL who had adverse outcomes. And then we substratified. The red, most severe, are patients who had a pre, who had preeclampsia before 34 weeks. That's considered severe preeclampsia. And the mean gestational age of those patients was 28 weeks. Fetal or neonatal death or preterm delivery because of placental insufficiency at less than 30 weeks. These are very, very bad outcomes. They're very serious. So if you look at the S-flit, which is that anti-angiogenic factor that binds up the VEGF, as early as the first trimester and towards the end of the second, it's dramatically higher in the patients with the severe adverse outcomes. Here you can see placental growth factor. It goes up less in those individuals, and it was significantly different if you look at the groups. The ratio, I think, says it all. Some patients have high S split. Some may have low placental growth factor. But the ratio goes up very, very early, way before there's any clinical evidence of disease. And in fact, if you think about quartiles rather than an absolute cutoff, at 16 to 19 weeks, the highest risk of adverse outcome was in patients who had the placental growth factor in the lowest quartile or the S-split in the highest quartile. And their odds ratio was 31. They had an over 30 times more likely to have an adverse outcome. And the negative predictive value, which means if you're not in that range, was 95%. So it's a reasonable test. Then if you take the individuals with the bad ratio and you add a lupus anticoagulant, 94% of them had a serious adverse outcome. Yet importantly, if you weren't in the lowest quartile of placental growth factor or the highest quartile of the S-flit, your number was 4.6. So we have some predictors that can guide treatment. None of these are FDA approved. They're not clinically available. This is the first study to show their utility in lupus. They've been used in general 
practice to pre pre predict preeclampsia, they don't perform as well in the general population because preeclampsia is less common. So your performance of your biomarker is very much related to how frequent the endpoint is that you're looking at. And finally, we've done some longitudinal profiling of the transcriptome of healthy and lupus pregnancies. And I think that's telling us a lot about what goes wrong in lupus, but it's also telling us a lot about the biology of normal pregnancy. So this cartoon is the graphic abstract to our paper. A talented postdoc drew it. This is pre-pregnant. This is postpartum. This is pregnancy. We looked at four specific profiles. And what you can see, these are inflammatory profiles, plasma cells and interferon response. The idea is that these inflammatory immune signatures are dramatically down-regulated in a healthy pregnancy. This dotted line is zero. It's what you see in a non-pregnant, healthy individual. So in a normal pregnancy, these have to go down. And we had the opportunity to look at some patients who had IVF. If these don't go down, the IVF isn't successful. It's a small number, but it tells you that the downregulation of inflammatory pathways is important. We then looked at uncomplicated lupus pregnancies. And here you can see that everything starts much higher than baseline in the un in the pre-pregnant state, you still have this important down-regulation in the ones without complications. You have a down-regulation of the interferon signature was characteristic of lupus, but it doesn't go as low. And then importantly, in the patients who end up with the adverse outcomes, this inflammatory signature doesn't go down, this doesn't go down, and this neutrophil response is much higher than in healthy controls, and neutrophils are actually seen in preeclamptic placentas. So what we've learned, I think, from the PROMISE study, looking at clinical data and biomarker data, is and looking at the mouse studies, is we can define predictors and we can identify targets for treatment. So now comes you know, our relationship with the FDA. We, um, we hypothesized that TNF blockers could significantly decrease the rate of fetal death or preterm delivery due to preeclampsia or placental insufficiency. We were focused on placental development, particularly in patients with antiphospholipid syndrome or lupus anticoagulant. If they had lupus, that was great. So you end up with a challenge, not just with the FDA, but with ethics committees. Can you get pregnant women into clinical trials? And as we heard with children, pregnant women are considered a vulnerable population because of their relationship with the fetus who can't consent. So that's even worse than the child who can't consent. The ethics committee argues that the therapy has to directly benefit or pose minimal risk. How do you define that? IRBs limit the inclusion of women, even if they can benefit from studies. And it's published in a number of sites that 80% of pregnant women who are getting a drug, 80% of drugs prescribed to pregnant women have never been studied in pregnancy. So we have an ethical societal problem given the limited amount of data. How can we give drugs to patients who are pregnant and we need to study vaccines, for example? We know very, very little. So my political statement before I close with my trial is that improving the health of pregnant women and their fetuses requires engaging them in clinical research so pregnant women can make decisions. And the few cases where there have been important interventions in pregnancy, HIV, particularly in patients with these rare autoinflammatory diseases, they insist on taking their drug. And efficacy has been proven. And there was really a groundswell about, trans, about vertical transmission. And it was pregnant women who argued to be in these studies and to take their drugs. So we actually finally convinced um, the NIH and the FDA to support us in a trial, the IMPACT trial, Improved Pregnancy Outcome in Antiphospholipid Syndrome with Sertilizumab Therapy. So our goal is to determine if 
TNF blockade added to standard therapy. So these patients, the standard therapy is uh, anticoagulation. So we add sertolizumab to standard therapy in high-risk patients, the patients who are defined at high risk based on the PROMISE study data. Um, and the reason why we're using uh, sertolizumab, it's a phase two single arm open label study, is because sertolizumab is pegylated. It doesn't have an FCPs. It doesn't cross the placenta. There is some evidence in looking at cord blood that, in fact, it really doesn't cross the placenta. Um, and our control population is the PROMISE population. And we have been alive for two years. It took us a year to deal with regulatory issues. We have an IND to use it. We've enrolled 13 patients. Um, only one patient who was screened refused to be in the study. The others were excluded because of study design. Um, and of all the patients who've been in the study, none of them have had preeclampsia or placental insufficiency. It's a small number because some are still pregnant, but there's not been a single case of preeclampsia or placental insufficiency. It's tiny. We need 45 patients to prove that we've decreased the frequency of <coughs> the adverse outcomes from 40% to 20%. If it stays as good as it is, we only need 17 patients, but we want to complete the study. Um, in some of our patients, this is their first successful pregnancy. So treatments to prevent poor pregnancy outcome require understanding of mechanisms of injury that I think animal models have been very informative. Um, and we're using the understanding both from the animal models and the simultaneous observation studies to try to test a new treatment. And I think there'll be more new treatments based on the mechanistic studies we're continuing to do, but the TNF treatment seemed like a good way to go as a first start. And our hope is that if impact is successful, we'll be able to use the same approach to look at high-risk preeclamptic patients who don't have autoimmunity. And individuals who have had early preeclampsia um, have about a 25% chance of having it again in their next pregnancy. So I think that's a population that would be of great value to study. So the first people I have to thank is my patients, all 800 in Promise and 13 in, in Impact. Uh, it took a lot of time and a lot of collaborators and um, quite a bit of money to do all of this work. So uh, I thank you and I'll take questions. Well, as a person who takes care of some patients with lupus, that's a very exciting thing, because young women certainly uh, want to have children and uh, can be very daunting for them. So questions? So has, have you or anybody else looked at the offspring of any of these pregnancies in terms of not just up until after birth, but rather five, 10, X number of years afterwards? Just the way earlier you heard about when you design a study, you're sometimes short-sighted because you're so focused on your endpoint. We don't have data. We have actually written a number of proposals to try to go back to find them and to do psychological testing, developmental testing, because there certainly are data that high levels of alpha interferon can affect neurocognitive development. And the issue of neurocognitive development in lupus patients is, is quite controversial in the offspring. So it's something we want to do, wanted to do, but haven't been able to do. But the patients in impact are going to be followed very closely. But it's a small number. Embarrassingly, and Tony, Tony Marion is in the audience, who you know, who studied lupus, and I thought I knew, and now realize from your talk I didn't, and I'd like you to clarify for everyone maybe, I thought that the antibodies that SLE patients have, which recognize DNA, some of them are the same antibodies, I thought, that recognize phospholipid, kind of one 
one and the same. So I got confused, okay. maybe from bad memory. So could you help okay. me with that? So antiphospholipid antibodies, the ones we talk about in this syndrome, actually recognize proteins. Those proteins conformation changes when they bind to negatively charged phospholipids. So beta-2 GP1, for example. So the ELISAs that define antiphospholipid antibodies are based on beta-2 probably more than anything else. So it's not really phospholipid. And there is a lot of cross-reactivity in kind of the not so distinct IgMs that lupus patients have. And it's not just DNA, there are a lot of DNA-related proteins, ribosomal proteins that, loop, I mean, the repertoire of autoimmune responses to things on nets and to things in nuclei and to things in dying cells that lupus patients have autoreactivity to is, is quite remarkable. Uh, so thanks. Uh, great talk, Jane. Really impressive work and great uh, to see how the biology of this is so much better understood now. Uh, a question about the IMPACT trial. Are you looking at the, uh, I'm just waving my hand so people I can see, see where I, I am. Um, are you looking at SFLT1 and PIGF in these patients also? Yes, that's and with, AIM2 of the proposal we're looking at. Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah, because I was just curious to know oh, yeah. whether they would normalize there. Yeah, well, my prediction is in patients who are responders, they shouldn't be high. If they are high in responders, then they're not mechanistically important. And then they're like non-causally important. And I think that'll be important to know. But yes, we're measuring all of that. And we're also looking for anti-DNA antibodies because TNF inhibition in lupus patients uh, stresses out rheumatologists. <laughs> we haven't gotten any positive anti-DNA in patients who don't have it in advance, and we haven't had any increase in antiphospholipid antibody levels in patients so far, but it's a very, very small number. Thanks. In the, event, in the interest of getting us to dinner, I'm going to press on with the last talk, but I invite you to come up and ask questions afterwards. Superb talk. <laughs> <laughs>